This morning, we want to continue in our series through the book of Ephesians. It's amazing how when you take a book of the Bible, many, many different topics are covered and they're pertinent for us today. We may not have the exact situation that they're facing. However, the principles of the truth of the Bible that were applied back then are still pertinent for us today. And so I want us to pick up, if you would turn to Ephesians chapter 1, we concluded last time looking at the, uh, the, the prayer of the Apostle Paul. And we know that he prayed this prayer for the believers there, but also I trust and believe that he prayed for other churches. You can pray this for yourself today. Uh, actually, turn to Ephesians chapter 2. I apologize. And we can pray this over ourselves. It's a great way to pray over other individuals. I pray this over you on a regular basis and, and some others that are listed here in Scripture. So we went through that last week, and we left off with the first part of chapter 2, the first few verses shows us the condition that we were in without Christ. Now, I believe that it's important for us to focus on the future, look ahead to what the Lord has in store, but I believe it's also important for us to remember our past, not to use it as a hitching post that it holds us down, but to remember what the Lord brought us out from. There were many times the Apostle Paul used his past and what he used to be like to what he is now to show the amazing amazing saving power of God one of us have a powerful testimony. You may say, well, I, I didn't do much bad. Well, great. You know, it doesn't matter how much bad in the natural you did. We were all in the same boat because we had a spirit that was separated from God. We were all sinners because of a sin nature. So we're all in the same place in the same location. But we're going to see some amazing things that God did. So in Ephesians chapter 2, the first three verses, this is where we left off. It says, as for you, you were dead in your trans transgressions and sins to which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath, objects of God's wrath. Well, verse 4 gives us God's response to our condition. Notice what it says. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, and we'll, we'll catch on to the rest of it in here in just a moment. Notice it says, it starts, but God. It doesn't matter what condition you found yourself but God. He did something supernatural. Many people realize the condition they're in in the first three verses, and they wallow in that. And they forget about the next verse that says, but God. And notice, what does it say that God is rich in? He's rich. Thank God for his mercy. He is rich in mercy, which allows him to do something about our condition. Now, mercy here is passing over deserved judgment. We need to have, I think, a good understanding of where we were headed without Christ. Do a study sometime on what hell is like, and I don't believe that hell will be the final place where individuals will spend eternity. We talk that way. But actually, if you go into Revelation, it, it appears it's a different place called the lake of fire because all of hell is cast into the lake of fire where it says the worm dies not out, talking about the maggots that, that infest dead bodies. It talks about the punishment that will be forever and ever. It's like, why is it so horrible? And we've talked about this before. It's because God allows you and I to go to a place, if we want to, that's totally opposite from him, where his presence is not. And what is that like? That's hell. That's a lake of fire. That's totally absent from God in his presence. And so if you want to go there, you're able to go there. And I think sometimes we need an understanding where we were headed apart from Christ. That's what I deserve. I deserve that punishment. I deserve all of that. Why? Because I had a sin nature. I was separated from a holy, righteous God, and he could have sent me there, and I, it would have been totally 100% justified. But God, in his mercy, 
In other words, the judgment that should have been poured out on me, it was passed over. But see, the judgment has to be poured out on somebody. It just can't be gone. You know, if you, if you do something wrong, say you, you stole money from somebody, now that person could say, well, I just forgive the debt. But generally, someone has to pay the debt. Something has to be done. Something has to be taken care of. And so it's that judge who passes down that judgment and sentence and says, this is the sentence, and then comes down and serves the sentence for you. So that's what God did. He said, you deserve death. You deserve eternity separated from me. But now I'm going to come down and I'm going to stand by you and I'm going to take that punishment upon myself. So the judgment was poured out, just not on you. It was poured out on Jesus. He suffered 100% in your place the way you should have suffered if you would have died in that sin nature. And he was raised with power over that and now turns around and offers that free gift, which we're going to look at in just a moment. But each one of us have to receive that gift. Thank God for his mercy. If you're ever having a bad day, if you're ever wondering, I just don't have anything to be thankful for, whew, just think about where you were headed apart from Jesus and say, thank you, Lord. But God, in his mercy, that should have been me, but it was poured out upon him. So he is rich. He's abounding with mercy, which compels him to do verses 5 and 6. Look at that. He made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, what part of you was made alive? Was, was your, when, when you accepted Christ, did your outward appearance change? I mean, did your, did your hair change colors? Did uh, your eyes change color? Did you get taller, shorter? No? Did you all of a sudden understand, wow, everything in your intellect totally increased, and it's like, whoa, I am so brilliant, I can't believe it. No, that didn't happen either, all right? The part of you that changed, we know, was on the inside. Your spirit, you are a spirit. That's what you are, that's who you are. You have a soul and you live in a body, but you're a spirit being. You're created in the image of God. God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in what? Spirit and in truth. So you are a spirit. When you receive Christ, that's the part of you that becomes brand new. The life of God sets up resonance in your spirit. The spirit of God himself comes to dwell on the inside of you. So that's the part of you that was quickened. Your salvation is what we call a vicarious act. A vicarious act. What does that mean? In other words, did Jesus need to be saved? No. He didn't need to, but as we said, he became that judgment for us. He identified with us. Vicarious means a substitute. He became our substitute again and now offers us salvation. You died on the cross and were crucified and suffered under the penalty of your sins and were raised again to salvation through Jesus, who's your substitute. Now, hold your place there and turn to Romans chapter 6. This is, a, this is like a powerful, powerful passage. Romans chapter 6, we're going to read verses 6 through 11. This is identity. And this is one of the reasons that we have water baptism is the identity that you have with Christ. It's a, a physical, visible testimony of what's already taken place on the inside. Romans chapter 6, starting with verse 6. We know that our old sinful selves, that's your spirit man, we're crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. That's good news right there. We are no longer slaves to sin, for when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we know we will also live with him. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead, and he will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin, but now that he lives... 
he lives for the glory of God so that you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. So, he tells us here, not only have you been freed from sin, but you've been given a place of authority. What's amazing is that you've been seated with Christ in heavenly places. Now, how can you be seated with Christ and still seated here at Solid Rock this morning? It's like, how can that, how can that be? I, can't, I can be seated in two different places places? Is it like my, my spirit's there and I'm physically here? Or, or what does he mean? How can I be seated with Christ? The word seated means, and it signifies something that has been completed. All right? Mark chapter 16, verse 19. We're not going to read it, but it says that Jesus sat down at the right hand of the Father. Now, does that mean that Jesus is super glued to that seat and can never get up? He's like, oh, I, got, I, I need to get up, and I can't get up. No, that's not what it's referring to, because we know that when, when uh, if you remember when, when Stephen was stoned, Jesus stood up. We know that Jesus is coming back for us on a white horse. We know, we see Jesus in, in different situations like that where he's not seated, but what it means is when he's seated in heavenly places and we're in Christ, we're seated in heavenly places, it means there's a completion to something. Okay, it doesn't mean he's never gonna move, but there's a completion. Some people will, you know, and we sing songs, and I'm not, not cutting down the songs, but in one sense, we just have to remember what we're singing. We, we glorify certain things. The old rugged cross, wonderful. I'm coming to the cross and all of them. Amazing, wonderful. Don't stop at the cross, okay? Because your salvation was not made complete at the cross. Thousands and thousands of people died on a cross. If Jesus, it was just the cross, you and I are still going to hell. Okay, because he would still be dead if it was just the cross. Now, on that cross, sin, all of sin of humanity was laid upon Jesus. And he was forsaken by the Father. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There's some, there, not just physical, but mental, spiritual things that happened to Jesus that no person will ever come close to suffering the way he did. You say, well, thousands of people were crucified. Yeah, but no one became sin for all of humanity the way Jesus did. And he died under the weight of that, suffered under the weight of that. But even when he was resurrected, it wasn't all over. Your redemption had not made, been made complete yet. It's not until Jesus ascended to heaven, offered his blood in the Holy of Holies as an eternal sacrifice for your sin, and is seated down at the right hand of the Father, now it's complete. Now it's complete. See, when Jesus said on the cross, it is finished, he's not talking about your salvation. There's still a long way to go with your salvation. The fulfillment of the old covenant was completed because Jesus said, I have come to fulfill the law and the prophets. So what Jesus had done concerning the old covenant was complete, not your redemption. There is still more for Jesus for the price to be paid. So now he's seated at the right hand of the Father. Thank God my salvation's secure. I don't have to worry about, well, is someone going to rip, rip me off and take my salvation away? Is the devil going to take it away? Can someone do that? It's impossible because it's been made complete. It's a done act. Okay? Your salvation is an act that was done in the past that has benefits continuing up till now and on into the future. All right, anyone at any time, as long as you're alive, any person surrendering their life to Jesus Christ, the mercy and the grace of God is available to that person. So even though we're on the earth, we're seated positionally with Christ, and our authority in Christ is a finished work. Look at verse number seven. Why is that? In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. So what is he talking about when it says here in the coming ages? Well, you have the, the second coming of Christ that ushers in the millennial reign of Jesus, a thousand years that he rules and reigns on this earth. I can't wait. I can't wait. You get fed up and sick and tired and discouraged and frustrated with the way governments are run and, and the politics and all of that. and everything. Man, Jesus will rule the rod of iron. It's his way, period. That's the way it is. And he will rule and reign on this earth for a thousand years. 
Now, that doesn't mean, even though you get frustrated with the way things are now, remember what's going to happen in the future and be praying for those in those positions of decision making. Praying for politicians, praying for government officials, praying for others. Continue to pray for them, first for their salvation, that they would come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Because the only thing that's really going to change, first of all, is their heart. There needs to be a heart change first. And so pray for those individuals. But remember, Jesus is coming. You know, you and I have so much to be thankful for. Like we said, if you're ever having a bad day, think about where you were headed, but God in his mercy. And then think about what's headed in the future. But Jesus is coming back really, really soon. And he's going to set up his kingdom here. And how I live now will determine how I rule and reign with Christ during that millennial reign. But that's not even the end. A thousand years will someday be done of his rule and reign here, but that ushers in something that goes beyond what you can even ask or think, a new heaven and a new, or the new heavens and the new earth. Everything made brand new. And out beyond that, beyond your wildest dreams and imagination of what God has. It says, eye is not heard, neither ear is heard. All that's been prepared that God has for us. And notice The key is, it's all in Christ Jesus. As long as you're in Christ, that's the key. That is the important part that you are a follower of Jesus Christ. And he will then show the exceeding riches of his grace. The best is yet to come. That's what I told my wife when we got married. The best is yet to come. (laughs) <laughs> and it is. It keeps getting better and better. Look at verses 8 and 9. This is very familiar. People really know this passage quite well. For it is by grace that you have been saved through what? Through faith. And this not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. Grace, God's unearnable favor, provided salvation and faith makes it personally mine. It's the same avenue through which I receive everything. Now, this is, notice it says, this is a gift of God. So what is it that's a gift of God? Grace, faith, salvation. Which one of those is a gift from God? Now, all of them are. All of them are. The faith that we have to believe came from the Lord. The grace of God, the salvation, it's all, think of this, you can't get, this is a horrible deal for God and a great deal for us. He didn't have to do any of it. He became sin, all of these things, and he turns around and he says, I know you can't earn this and work for it. I know that you are in and of yourself incapable of doing anything to get this, and so hear what? Um, I, I give you, because of my grace, I'm providing salvation, and to top it all off, I'm going to give you the faith to believe it so you can receive it. Everything that we need to make this complete in us personally comes from him. It's a gift from him. Now, Turn to Titus chapter 3. Grace, salvation, nor faith to receive it comes from us. They are gifts of God. This is probably, and I want to spend just a little bit of time here, and in the next few verses ties in with this, probably the the biggest area that's a stumbling block for people. And, And many of you, if you've been out there and you've talked with individuals and shared the gospel with them or you asked them the question, you know, if you, if you would die tonight and you stood before God and he said, why should I let you into heaven, what would you say? Probably the number one answer that people will give is, I hope to make it on my good works. Not my good looks, but my good works. I'm hoping that, it, because I haven't been that bad. I'm not as bad as so-and-so. I haven't killed anybody, I haven't done that, I have that, you know, and, and so what about those people that maybe have taken another life or, or someone who's done something in the natural we think of really, really bad? How about, how about those people? They stand no chance. And, and so we, we bring it down a lot of times to works. I'm hoping that in the end, my good works will outweigh, will outweigh my bad. And so Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9 are great verses to take someone to because your opinion doesn't matter anything. What matters is what the Bible says. And you're not saying it, the Bible's saying it. So you take them back, okay, 
you think it's by works, right? Well, let's just look. What does the Bible have to say about that? So you take them to Ephesians chapter 2. Another great passage is in Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, let's read verses 4 through 8. It says, But when God our Savior revealed his kindness and love, he saved us, notice this, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. Thank God for his mercy again. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Because of his grace, he declared us righteous. Wow. And gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. That, that, that is so powerful. He, he didn't give us the judgment because of his mercy. He does give us righteousness because of his grace. He's so good. He not only says, I'll pass over the judgment when, when you come to me. And that's like, wow, that would be amazing right there. But now he says, I have something for you. Here, here's grace I'm pouring out on you. You didn't earn this. You didn't work for it. I, I'm just giving you everything that you need, and it's all based in my grace. I like to think of it this way, is that think of a, a, a big ocean, a big ocean, and in that ocean, it, and that represents God's grace, okay? Didn't earn it, didn't earn it, didn't work for it. In that ocean are all of God's promises, everything that you ever need, so vast. How, how do I get in there? And pull those out and make them mine. They've been given to me, but I have to do something to make them mine. They just don't automatically happen. So think about it as my faith, and we've used this illustration before, my faith is that fishing pole that goes in and pulls out those promises and makes it mine. Now it's even better than that, but it helps me think of it in my head. So my faith reaches into God's grace, and my faith isn't even from me, remember, it's from God. So it reaches into God's grace and lays hold of those promises and that faith makes it mine. I believe it. Why? He's given it to me. He said it in his word and it's in his grace. I can't work for it and I can't earn it. So it makes it mine. So both God's mercy and grace have been poured out toward us. Now go back to Ephesians. Ephesians, this, this is so good. It's so easy to get sidetracked talking about these things. I want to stay focused for you. Uh, verse 10 in Ephesians chapter 2. For we are God's workmanship, created, here we go again, in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Well, I thought you said good works didn't have anything to do with this. Now, it's not telling us that we're saved through works because this would be a contradiction of the previous verse that he just laid out. The good works come into play after we've been born again. I want to read verse 10 out of the New Living Translation. It says, for we are God's, I like this, masterpiece. Do you realize that? You are a masterpiece. Don't let anybody tell you any different. You are a masterpiece that God's continuing to make more and more amazing because every day, because of decisions you're making, I'm trusting, you're looking more and more like Jesus. So that when people look at you, they don't see you anymore. It's like, wow, that, that's Jesus. That's Jesus living through them. So you are God's masterpiece, again, because of Christ. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. So we don't even have the ability on our own to do the good works. A good nature produces good works. See, you don't do good works because you're good, but the good nature that you have on the inside, that born-again nature, will produce those good works. So you produce the works because of the good nature. You don't, because of the good works, get a new nature. Does that make sense? So what I have on the inside is producing the good works. Now, Let's look, I, I want to take just a moment here and, and bear with me because right in here again, I, I mentioned a lot of people will say, I hope my good works outweigh my bad. 
Well, we looked at two verses that tell us that's not it, but people will then take you to James and they'll connect works as necessary for salvation. And I want us to take a look at that for a minute. So put your marker in Ephesians and go back to James right towards the end of the book, uh, the Bible, James chapter 2. And we're going to read several verses because I, I want you to get the context of this. You will run into people who will use this, all right, connecting works with salvation and being born again, that it's not just faith. So in James chapter 2, starting with verse number 14, what good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds or no works? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is out clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by actions, is what? Is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person, notice this, is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. Sounds like a contradiction here. In the same way was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. As we look there, you see verses 14, 21, and 24 sound like works are needed for salvation and not faith alone, as Paul states in Ephesians. Because James, this James is the, the half-brother of, of Jesus. None of his brothers believed on him until after the resurrection. This James, they have the same mother Mary, but not the same father, obviously. And James writes this, Paul writes the other, who's right? Is James saying that I'm not truly justified or born again by faith alone? I have to add works to it? In other words, what Jesus did, did he provide now a way so I can work for my salvation and earn my salvation? Is that what he's referring to? Because this passage will be used, people will use this to try to share that. Realize this, when you and I read through the Bible, if there's something we don't understand, it doesn't contradict other areas, and it, it does, there, there are no contradictions in the Bible. You read it along the surface, and you might read things, and it's like, well, this doesn't sound like it matches with this. What's up? That's where you notice Paul told Timothy, study, 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 to show yourself approved, a workman, who needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You have to study in order to rightly divide the word. In other words, if you don't study, there's a possibility for you to wrongly divide or understand the word. And that's why you can't just take one single area or one single scripture. How does that coincide and how does that interpret with other scripture together? Because this is not a contradiction of what Paul is saying back in Ephesians chapter 2. In the context of this passage, and I encourage you to read the entire, read the entire book. It's, it's an amazing book. But in the context of this passage, James is talking to saved people. He's talking to born-again individuals living out their salvation for others to see. In other words, if I am a genuinely saved I want to produce good works to please Christ. And he goes on to give an example of someone who is in need of daily food and sustenance, and I have the opportunity and the ability to help them and bless them, and I don't do it. I'm not producing good works. And he's saying, you know what? It comes into question. I'm looking at your works, and you have nothing that I can see that shows that you're a follower of Jesus Christ. 
how do I know? Just by what you say, taking your words? Well, if you're really a follower of Christ, it should be produced in your works, in the way that you live, and how you handle situations. People are watching your life. And what do they see? They hear your words, and they see your works. So he's questioning how a person with God's nature of love can refuse to help a person in need. Your lack of works is proving that you may not really be saved. Now, does that mean if I don't follow through and help somebody that I lose my salvation? No, that's not what he's talking about. This is just what others are observing in your life. In verse 14, it says, if a man claims to have faith. It doesn't say he actually does have faith, but that he says he does. So the only way I can see your faith is through your works. Faith and works go hand in hand, and your faith is matured or perfected through your good works. I want to, I want to read something to you here. It's, under, it's a really good commentary, and it explains this really well. It, it says this. It says, uh, concerning verse 21, and Abraham and Isaac, when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar, it's clear from Genesis 22 that Abraham proved his faith in God when he was asked to offer Isaac as a sacrifice. It was faith that led him to act uh, this act of obedience. Had he refused to obey, it would have demonstrated that he had no faith in God or his word. It's also clear that this act of faith and works was not his initial justification by faith. That was at least 40 to 50 years before offering Isaac in Genesis chapter 15, the first three verse, or first six verses. So in other words, what James is talking about is not the initial decision of Abraham to believe God. That was 40 years earlier. That's when God told him, you're going to have a son, okay? What we're talking about here is many years later when he has a son. And back in Genesis, it says that he, it was credited to him, his faith in God, it was credited to him as righteousness. And we also see an example here of Rahab, given as an example, proving her faith, that faith in her heart through her outward actions. Now, here's what's really interesting in, in verses, and you can write this down and look at it. In verses 21, 24, and 25, the words righteous and justified in those passages mean to bring out the fact that a person is righteous or justified. In other words, the good deeds don't make them righteous, but bring out the fact that they are already righteous. We could say of Abraham and both Rahab, they were proven justified through their good works. And that's what this is referring to. James is saying, if you're really born again, if you're justified, if you're made righteous with God through faith and faith alone, you better be producing that in good works in the way that you live. It didn't bring salvation to you and make you born again, but if you're really born again, you should live different. Your life should look different. You shouldn't act like the world. You shouldn't be like the world. Because of a new nature on the inside, you should be producing good works that proves you're born again, that proves you're righteous, that proves you're justified. Unfortunately, there are too many people, as Corinthians talks about, believers, and Paul's writing to the church, they're living like carnal, almost unsaved people. He's saying, I can't tell a difference in your life and someone who's a rank sinner who's not a follower of Christ. That, my friends, is a horrible indictment against us as individuals in my walk with the Lord. If no one can tell I'm a follower in Jesus Christ, there's issues, there's problems. If you're like everybody else at work, if you're like everybody else at school, if you're like everybody else wherever you go that's not a follower of Christ, there's something wrong with you, not Christ. And what he's telling us here, get on board and begin to produce the works that you should as a born-again believer. Quit acting like everybody else. It's got to stop. You got to live right. You got to follow after God. You're made holy on the inside. Now prove it on the outside for other people to see. That, my friends, is what James is saying here. So it's no more living like the world. Does that mean we're going to be perfect? No. But if I mess up, people see my repentance. I'm coming back. I'm asking God for forgiveness. He cleanses me. I can walk with him, continue to produce those good works. This is what James is talking about, not the initial justification or making it right with God. Now, I'm going to close with this. Remember the example, again, showing uh, people can't... They can't see your faith on the inside. They have to see it with outward action. You remember when Jesus, <clears throat> excuse me, is in Capernaum, and the, there's a man who's paralyzed, and he's got four buddies 
who pick him up and say, we're going to Jesus. So they bring him to the house where Jesus is ministering, but it's so packed with people, they can't get in. Like, how are we going to get to Jesus? We need to get our paralyzed friend to Jesus so he can get healed. How are we going to do this? So what do they do? Where do they go? Up on the roof. They go up on the roof, tear the roof apart. I believe they went back and fixed it. All right, it's part of those good works too later on. They tear the roof apart. And can you imagine being there? And I, I love, I just, I just love thinking in my own mind of how the Pharisees are responding to all of this. <laughs> they're, they're watching all this go and debris falling all over the place and, and they're letting down this, these, these guys up here with their faces, you know, big smiles letting this guy down in the midst of Jesus and everything that's going on. And Jesus sees the man coming down. Turn a few to Mark chapter 2. Notice what Jesus says to them. In Mark chapter 2 verses 3 through 5. Some men came bringing to him a a paralytic carried by four of them. Since they could not get to him, Jesus, uh, get to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus and after digging through it, lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on. When Jesus, what? Saw their faith. He saw their faith. He said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. How did Jesus see their faith? Were they wearing t-shirts that says, I got faith? Were they, is that what they were doing? No. He saw actions. He saw what they were doing that proved they had faith. If they didn't have faith that this guy was going to get healed or that coming to Jesus wouldn't have done any good, they're not going up and tearing the roof apart and letting this guy down. I mean, this is a risk that they're taking. It's proving they have faith in what Jesus is going to do. Jesus saw their faith. Do people see your faith? Have people seen your faith this last week? The way you handle business deals? Have they seen your faith? The way that you talk to teachers? The way you talk to parents? Parents, the way you talk to your kids? Coworkers? Have they seen your faith lived out before them? Jesus saw their faith. And then there were amazing results because of this. And I encourage, read, read the whole story. This is pretty amazing of what happens and takes place because he says your sins are forgiven and that causes a stir, okay, with some of those that are around there. But in, in one sense, I, I'd have been kind of like the guy. It's like in the natural, I'm thinking, that, that's great, Jesus, but uh, my sins forgiven aren't helping my legs to walk. Uh, anything else you got here? Anything else to, to go on? And, and you can read the rest, as Paul Harvey would say, or the rest of the story. So let's, let's really focus this week. Now, y- you shouldn't... Uh, you shouldn't... Just do one more minute. Just one more minute, okay? You, you shouldn't... Producing good works, producing good works isn't me going out trying to, oh, I've got to, I've got to produce good works and trying, a tree doesn't do that, a tree doesn't grunt and groan to try to produce fruit. It just produces from what's on, on the inside of that tree, it produces out. And what was in that seed? Well, you've been born again, not of corruptible seed, thank God. <laughs> you've been born again from the seed of the word of God and the blood of Christ. So what's producing when I receive Christ, I'm a good tree, okay? I've got what I produce is from the life of God flowing out from me. I'm not forcing myself to try to do this. Yes, yes, it, I have to put forth my effort, but you don't have to try to force those things. Just live like Jesus. Just relax and rest in him. Listen to the spirit of God and just begin to produce Now, it may be difficult at first, but the more you do something and make the use of all the opportunities that you have. There will be many opportunities today, tomorrow, throughout the week for you to get frustrated, you get angry, to to get depressed, discouraged, whatever it may be. Use those as opportunities for stepping stones, not stumbling blocks. Use those, say, okay, this is a great opportunity for me to prove that God's word is true. This is a great opportunity for me to begin to produce good works in the midst of this because of the nature that I have on the inside. Begin, one of the best ways, when you're getting frustrated, just start praying in the spirit. Just start speaking scripture. Just start doing those things or quietly under your breath just worshiping God. Okay, what's happening in the midst of that, you're taking that power on the inside and it's beginning to work its way out and it will produce good works. So I'm standing in line 
and I'm frustrated, and I'm worshiping the Lord, and I'm praising Him, and by the time I get to the cashier, what happens? I have a great attitude, and I treat that person with respect, even if they're ticked off, and they aren't nice to me. Why? I'm producing now good works because of the nature on the inside that I've been stirring up. But if I stand back there, and I'm angry and frustrated, and I'm cursing everybody out in the line in front of me, and they're doing all these price checks. Now, this didn't happen to me last week. Don't say I'm not. It may sound like he's talking from experience. I am, but not last week. So if you're there, now if I'm, what I'm doing is I'm feeding the flesh, and by the time I get up to that cash register, I'm ticked off, and I'm angry, and the way I react to her or he and what they say, it's not producing good works. I'm showing like I'm acting like every other jerk who's come through the line. And then I'm done, and I'm, oh, here's a track. Read that, okay? <laughs> Please, if you're going to act that way, don't be passing out tracks, okay? Get things right first and then pass the tracks out. No. Uh, let's pray.